Oh, Looks like lose. Linda jumped off. Uh oh, we lost Linda. Uh oh. Well, in that case, what I'll do is um, introduce Mitch Towner, who's our speaker for today. And uh, without further ado, he's going to talk about making a plan, which is a great topic, I think. So, Mitch, you're on. Great. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I lived in Austin uh, for six years and now currently live in Tucson, where I'm a professor at University of Arizona. Um, and can everyone see my slides now? Yeah. Yes, yes. All right, perfect. All right, so making a plan is uh, important. Wait, how do I? Okay, there we go. Um, it's, it's a really important skill that you need to develop in sort of all aspects of bridge. So it's very similar to chess, you know, like in chess, you'll watch the best players in the world and they'll know what they're going to do for the next eight moves or the next 10 moves. And so the really, really talented people can plan that far ahead. And so we want to kind of try and develop those same skill set, but apply it to bridge. And so as an example of this, if you ever watch the Bermuda Bowl, which is the world championships with all the best bridge players in the world, as soon as the bidding's done, everyone thinks for you know 30 seconds before they make an opening lead. When dummy hits, they'll think for a couple of minutes, um, just trying to plan sort of, you know, what do they think, uh, how the is gonna play the hand, how are the defenders gonna possibly set this hand? And so they'll sit there and think for several minutes before they play a single card. And then they're so good at projecting, sometimes the whole hand will take 20 seconds because everyone knows where all the cards are, right? So you can count, you know, declare opened a strong no trumps. We know they have 15 to 17 points and we can see how many points dummy has and we can project how many points, you know, our partner has and try and think through everything, all right? And so we may not be able to do sort of the whole hand like they can just when they see the dummy. But what I highly recommend you do with your partner is develop what I call a 30 second rule. All right. And so what that means is when you're on defense, as soon as dummy hits, no matter what, even if you know exactly what you're going to play, you're always going to wait 30 seconds before you play a card. And the reason that you do that is, you know, sometimes you don't have a problem, but other times, you know, you may make a silly mistake or you may not actually know what to do. And if you're consistent and always wait 30 seconds, then you're not giving away any information that you have a problem or you don't have a problem. Now, this isn't easy. you got to practice it. You know, your instinct is going to be like, well, I know what I'm going to play. You know, that my partner led a suit versus no Trump. And so I'm going to play my high card. But you always take 30 seconds and then you're not giving anything away. So that's like a tip that I would give all aspiring players when you're on defense is always wait 30 seconds when dummy um, hits the table. And then that way you can uh, work on making this plan. Now, I've been saying make it. The reception is breaking up badly. It is. Um, no, it's, it's not. not. It's not? No. OK. All right, well, I'll keep going. Let me know if th there is an issue. Um, all right, so I've been talking about making a plan. You know, We've been talking about it in defense. Um, but really, it applies to sort of all aspects of bridge. So for example, let's say your partner opens a no trump. Now you know they're 15 to 17. Now you're the captain. You're gonna wanna ask them questions to try and place the contract, all right? Now, one thing that, you know, I was playing with my grandpa last week and I opened a no trump and he transferred to hearts. Now, what do you think my most likely bid is when he bid two diamonds? Well, I was gonna bid two hearts because that's what he told me to do. And then what he did was, as soon as I bid two hearts, now he starts thinking for two minutes. All right. Now, what's the problem with that? Now, everyone at the table knows that he has some sort of marginal hand. Maybe he has an invitational hand um, and he's not sure if he should bid or maybe he has a really strong hand. He's not sure how to describe his hand. But we know he doesn't have just kind of a normal transfer and, you know, bid something else. And so what you want to do is you can project that I'm going to bid two hearts. And so before you bid two diamonds, again, stop, slow down, 
think for 90 seconds before you bid two diamonds and make your plan on what you're going to do after it goes two diamonds, two hearts, then what's your next bid? That's an example of making a plan during the auction. We all like to make a plan during while we declare the hand, right? Dummy hits and we sit there and we look at the combined hands and we say, okay, we're in no trump. You know, if I set up my clubs, then I'll have running clubs and I can, you know, take all those tricks and get to my nine tricks. So I think it's probably the easiest and what we're best at doing is making a plan during declare because we can see both the hands and we are trying to decide, you know, how do I get back and forth between the two hands and so we're going to try and project that that plan. Um, we've been talking about making a plan during defense, and so I'm going to give some examples of that too, but we want to project, you know, okay, so if I win this trick, you know, what do I want to shift to? And so before I win the trick, I should probably make the plan on what I want to play next, because if I don't know what I want to play, then maybe I don't want to win the trick. Maybe I want to duck. Or maybe I want to duck because I want to screw up declarer's entries, but I need to have a plan. So we can't just instinctively um, play on defense. We want to try and project a couple of tricks ahead. And then one of the hardest one that's still possible is some of the best players are actually able to project how the play is going to go while they're bidding. So during the auction, I'll give you an example at the very end of the, the most extreme version of this, but they can sort of picture what their um, partner's hand looks like relative to their hand. And they might be able to, you know, say, okay, well, I'll probably knock out, you know, the ace in this suit and then draw trumps and then I'll have all these winners. And they're able to kind of project that without even formally seeing their partner's hands. All right. So those are all the different kinds where we might want to make a plan. So what are the benefits of making a plan? Well, if the best players do it, we probably want to emulate the best players. So it's going to make us have better scores. We're going to, you know, get our 60% games instead of our 55% games. Um, second thing, it really helps to avoid some mistakes and especially careless mistakes. The most common mistake that everyone makes is at trick one, you know, dummy hits. Oh, I'm instinctively just going to, you know, win the trick. Oh, wait, maybe I shouldn't have won that trick. So the trick one is where all the mistakes happen. And that's why we really like that 30 second rule. Because if we do wait those 30 seconds, then we're less likely to make the careless mistakes. We're still going to make mistakes because bridge is a game of mistakes. But if we can reduce the number of careless mistakes, it goes back to that first one, we're going to get a much better score. All right, next two are about information. So another thing that good players do is they'll see that you huddled or had some issue when you were playing a trick, all right? And then that's gonna give them some sort of information about what your holding is. Um, the classic example is, let's say there's king queen of a suit and dummy and declares leading up towards the king queen. Now, let's say they play the king and then you think for a long time and then duck your ace. Do you think they have a pretty good sense on where the ace is? Yeah. You gave away that information by, by huddling over the king. Whereas if during those 30 seconds, you had made a plan of, all right, well, if they lead up towards the king queen, I know I need to duck to tangle up their entries. And now they don't know who has the ace and they're gonna be guessing on how to play the hand. The other issue is you may have heard of this unauthorized information. It doesn't come up a lot, but, um, Basically, if you huddle, you're telling your partner something and by law, by rule and bridge, they can't know that information based on your tempo. And so the director could actually even be called and make you, you know, play cards in a certain way when you give away unauthorized information based on your huddle. Um, same thing in an auction. If you ask for key cards and then you think, 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 and then you finally sign off now your partner knows that they were thinking about bidding slam and you may bar your partner from bidding again whereas if you just had your plan of i'm going to ask and then you know sign off then your partner doesn't have this unauthorized information this so they can keep bidding whatever they want and then the last thing is the more you plan and try and project ahead you're going to just become a better bridge player it's going to improve your logic so maybe the first time you can only think about this trick and the next trick, you know, so if I win the ace, what suit am I going to shift to? But the more you practice, maybe you'll 
have some plan like, okay, I'll win the ace, shift to this, my partner will win, shift to this and back and forth, and you'll be able to project further ahead, All right? So those are the big benefits of making a plan. So now I'm gonna do a couple examples of, um, we're gonna do bidding and then play and then defense. So we're just gonna sort of go one at a time. So here's a hand where the first seat, non-vulnerable, and we have a singleton spade, king third of hearts, king jack fourth of diamonds, and ace queen fifth of clubs. So we have a, a pretty nice 13 point hand. And now I want everyone to just think for about 20 seconds, what would you open with this kind of hand? All right. So everyone try and think. Singleton spade, king third of hearts, king jack fourth of diamonds, ace queen fifth of clubs. All right. So some of the questions we want to be thinking is what is the most likely response from partner? All right. Let's say we opened a club. We're going to bid our four card majors up the line. We don't have very many spades. So there's 12 spades with the other three people. So it's pretty likely the partner has four spades. So it's, we can already sort of project what the issue is going to be, right? So let's say we open a club and partner bids a spade. Now what do we do? We have a big problem, right? If we rebid a no trump, we're saying we have a balanced hand. We have at least a doubleton spade, which we don't have. If we rebid two diamonds, that's a reverse, right? If we bid at one level and then we bid at the second level at a higher ranking suit, that's a reverse showing 16 or more points. So yeah, we have five clubs and four diamonds, but we don't have enough points to do a reverse. We could rebid two clubs. So a club, a spade, two clubs, but usually that shows six clubs and we only have five, all right? The other problem with two clubs is that shows anywhere from about 12 points to 18 points. So it's really not a very good description. And so given all these issues, what most experts would bid with this hand is they would start with a diamond instead of a club. And then the benefit of that is if now partner bids a spade like we're worried about, now we can rebid two clubs, which again is a little bit of a lie. We think we have longer diamonds than clubs, but at least we've shown that we have diamonds and clubs, an unbalanced hand, and we've limited our hand to about 12 to 14 points. Right? So that's probably a, the smallest lie that we can tell because we planned ahead. A right? couple other possible things here. Um, if, let's say I had four little diamonds and ace, king, queen, fifth of clubs. In that sort of situation, now I might open a club and rebid two clubs because ace, king, queen, fifth of clubs kind of looks like six clubs. We have so many good clubs and such bad diamonds. But in this situation, we're kind of, you know, pretty balanced between our diamonds and clubs. And so that's why I would recommend opening a diamond and then rebidding two clubs. One last thing about this hand is let's say we open a diamond like we planned to, and now partner bids a heart. Now, some of you may not be comfortable raising partner on three hearts because they're only promising four hearts. And I understand but this hand is really, really good hand for hearts because you can just, again, sort of think how the hand's going to play is let's say partner only has four hearts. They're going to win the opening lead, knock out the spade, and then they can rough their spades in the short trump hand, which is always good whenever you can rough in the short trump hand, and then they're going to maintain their length in, in spades. So my plan would be I'm going to open a diamond. If partner bids a spade, I'm going to rebid two clubs. If partner bids a heart, I'm going to bid two hearts. That would be my plan before I even started. But so you want to have that whole dialogue in your head and, you know, take 30 seconds or whatever to make that plan before you even open. Because if you just instinctively say, oh, clubs are my longest suit, I'm going to open a club, then you can see that already we have some issues if partner bids a spade. So that's an example of making a plan during the bidding. All right. Let's do our second one. All right, 
here's our second one. So we're in the third seat. No one's vulnerable. And partner opens a heart. And we have four little spades, a void in hearts, king and a diamond, and then ace, queen, jack, ten, nine, seventh of clubs. Pretty good hand, but the void in partner's suit isn't, isn't that good. So obviously it depends a little bit on what your system is, but everyone take you know another 15 seconds and think what's your plan over partner bidding a heart? What would you do with this hand? And some good questions you might wanna ask yourself is what kind of hand do we consider to this? Do we think it's an invitational hand, a game forcing hand, a weak hand? And then again, we wanna think about what's partner gonna do over whatever we do. So the way that I would think about this hand is, you know, just counting our points, we have about a 10 point hand. So that's squarely an invitational. The long club suits make it a better hand, but the void and partner suit makes it a worse hand. So I'd still sort of view this as an invitational hand. Now our instinct might be, well, let's bid a heart and then, oh, sorry, let's bid a spade over a heart because we have four spades and we might wanna find our four, four spade fit, okay? Now that's fine, but what happens if partner rebids two hearts? Or what happens if partner rebids two diamonds? Now we're kind of in jail, right? Because if we bid now at the three level, that should show a forcing hand. And so depending on how you play your system, a lot of people will play, if you jump to the three level, it's an invitational hand. So a heart past three clubs would be an invitational hand with clubs. So that is what I would plan on bidding with this hand if you had that agreement, because that's where all your action is. Your hand just looks like clubs and only clubs. And I'd be too worried that if I bid a spade, if we don't have a 4-4 spade fit, then I'm gonna, not ever gonna be able to describe my hand when partner rebids hearts and I'm just gonna be kind of stuck. So I wanna get my whole hand off my chest as quickly as possible by showing uh, an invitational hand with clubs, all right? And so, you may have <clears throat> different system bids. So if you play like Bergen raises, for example, where that would be a heart raise, you obviously couldn't do that, but we could start, do something like ignore the spades again and bid a four C no trump. And then whatever partner bid now bid clubs. And that would show this sort of hand that's all in clubs. Like I would try and emphasize the clubs, however you do that with your system. But again, instead of just instinctively responding to spade, we wanna make a plan and you know, this was a hand that was similar that was given in the bridge world where they pulled a bunch of experts. And you know, I'd be fine if you decided you thought this hand was worth a game forcing hand. If your style is my partner always has you know 13 points when they open, and I think this hand is too good and I want to describe it all, then that's fine if you want to you know bid it as a game forcing hand, and you can start with two clubs, a heart, two clubs showing the strength of your hand. But before you bid a spade, we need to plan sort of how strong we think the hand is and bid our hand that way. So, you know, it's gonna depend on your system, but the, the big thing is planning ahead, again, over what partners most likely rebid's gonna be. All right, next bidding example. So there's a lot of common competitive situations where, for example, we're bidding hearts and the opponents are bidding spades. When I play at the table, I like to joke, right? Like, you know, uh, my, my opponents bid four hearts and then I say transfer and I bid four spades because even though it's not a transfer, it's just so common that you wanna sacrifice when you have a big spade fit over their four heart bids, right? And so you can sort of project that. So let's give an example of some situation where we're bidding hearts and they're bidding spades <clears throat> and how we might wanna plan ahead. So our partner opens a week three hearts and our right-hand opponent overcalls three spades. That's what it means, it's in parentheses. And unfavorable, so we're vulnerable and they're non-vulnerable. So we have a singleton spade, we have king third of hearts, so we have a heart fit with them and shortness in spades, so we think they have a big spade fit. We have three little diamonds and we have these potentially running clubs, all right? So clearly our hand's good enough that we probably want to bid four hearts you know if partner has the east queen seventh of hearts our hands really really good um 
But what do you think our opponent's going to do once we bid four hearts? Well, they don't have many hearts because we have a 10 card heart fit. They have a spade fit with their partner and they have some values because we only have 10 points. So you're pretty confident that if you bid four hearts, then they're going to bid five, four spades. So we want to plan ahead again over this. And so one thing you could do is you could say, okay, well, I'm fine with just bidding four hearts. And if they bid four spades, then I'm done with the hand. That's fine. You could try and put maximum pressure on them right now by jumping to five hearts and making them guess if they want to bid five spades. Um, a we kind just of lost the uh, video and the sound. Well, I still have you here, uh, so that may be an issue that's local to the club. We're back. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Um. So another kind of cute bid that you might want to make instead of bidding four hearts is you could say, well, all my values are in clubs. And maybe if I clue partner into that, A, whenever partner gets on lead, they might lead a club for me. And B, if they happen to have a big club fit with you, maybe they'll continue to bid over four spades. So you can kind of involve your partner by instead of bidding four hearts, you could bid four clubs. Now that may be a bid you've never seen before, and that's, that's fine. And you know, you may be worried the partner's gonna misinterpret it. Um, so maybe that's not the right bid for your partnership, but we wanna be asking all those questions on sort of what do we think's gonna happen if we bid four hearts over three spades. And we can, we're pretty confident they're gonna bid four spades just given our lack of spades, our big fit and not that many points, all right? So the thing that I would hate to see that I think is, would be really bad is if you bid four hearts, they bid four spades, and then it goes pass, pass back to you. And now you go into the tank and you think for two minutes because you're not sure what to do, right? It was really predictable that they were gonna bid four spades. And so before you bid four hearts, take your time and make a plan. Are we gonna compete to the five level? Are we gonna let it go? Do we wanna try and do this fancy four club bid? And you should know what you're gonna do when it goes four spades, pass, pass back to you because you already did the thinking before you bid. Um, and again, that's gonna avoid unauthorized information and give uh, lack the information to the opponents and make a better plan, all right? A um, Couple other kind of common bidding situations is before you bid key card, you should have a plan for all responses, right? You're asking your partner a question, there's only four responses they're gonna give. They're either gonna bid five clubs, five diamonds, five hearts, and five spades. Now, some issues. Well, maybe if they have two with, that's gonna get us too high. Maybe we need them to have three key cards. All right, so then maybe we don't wanna be asking key card. Maybe I really need to know about the queen, but we're not gonna have enough room to ask for the queen because uh, we're, we're bidding hearts. And if partner bids five diamonds, I'm not gonna have enough room to ask for the queen. So before you bid the key card, what you wanna do is you wanna make a plan for, okay, if they show one key card, I'm going to slam. If they show two, I'm going to slam. If they show three, I'm gonna ask for the grand slam, whatever your, your, your plan is. Um, it might also be that like your hand isn't such a good hand to be the one that ask, actually asks for the key cards. So if all you have are aces, it's frequently better for your partner to ask for the key cards because they can see all the kings and queens in their hand to see sort of um, how high you should go. Whereas all you're gonna find out is, okay, well, I had three aces and my partner has the fourth ace, but I still have no idea where the rest of their points are. All right, so whenever you're asking some sort of question, before you ask the question, take your time and what are we doing over all the possible responses, all right? And then the last bidding thing is we wanna keep it simple. So if we just have a hand where we know we want to play three no trump, partner's a limited hand, we have stuff everywhere, we don't need to be fancy. You know, we don't want to start doing asking bids and uh, worried the partner's going to raise us above three no or pass us, you know, in three of a minor. If we know where we want to play the hand, just bid the, you know, we want to play three no, let's just bid three no, 
and avoid any of those accidents or giving away more information to the opponents. All right. So those are all the examples that I came up with in terms of bidding. Um, but the basic premise is, you know, when you're asking questions, you want to um, have a plan on what you're going to do with all the responses. And you always want to think about sort of what we think is going to happen, you know, either what partner is going to rebid or what the opponents are going to do to interfere and at least have a sense of what we're going to do. Sometimes the auction is going to surprise us and it's going to go a different direction and we'll have to think. But when it's very predictable stuff like this firsthand where um, we think that it's most likely partners going to respond to spade, we need to think through that plan before we open instead of, oh, they responded to spade. Now I have no idea what to do. All right. So that's in bidding. Now let's do some declare play stuff. All right. So here's a hand, play hand number six. We're south and we have, you know, our nice four, triple three, 15 count. So we open a no trump, 15 to 17. And we're playing imps. So that means we want to do whatever we can to make sure that we take our nine tricks. Or, well, we're not in three no yet, but we're going to end up in three no. So whatever game or whatever contract we're in, we want to try and make sure we make it no matter what. All right. Now let's look at North's hand. North has two little spades, two little hearts, ace, king, six, the diamonds, and 10 third of clubs. Now, this is going to be more about the play, but with this kind of hand, it's only seven points. But whenever you have a good five card suit, I say add an additional point. And when you have a good six card suit, add an additional two points. So this becomes a nine point hand. And if your diamonds run, think about no trump. If we can take six diamonds, then our hand's going to be really, really, really good. All right. So instead of trying to be, you know, no man's and invite with two no, I would recommend just bidding three no, because if the diamonds run, then we're going to get, we're going to make three no. And if the diamonds don't, then we might be in big trouble. All right. So we bid one no, three no. And then West leads the four of hearts. And we're going to do our 30 second rule. So dummy hits and we're going to try and make a plan. So let's everyone try and think about this hand. So the heart's going to come into our ace queen. That's good. So we want to count our winners. So we have the ace queen of hearts guaranteed. Doesn't matter where the king is with this lead. So that's two tricks. We have the ace of clubs. That's a third trick. We have uh the ace of spades at least that's a fourth trick and then we have all these diamonds right if we can run our diamonds that's going to give us six tricks so that's already 10 tricks and we only need nine tricks so what's our conventional wisdom when we have nine cards in a suit with the ace king we say eight ever nine never right if we have the ace king with nine card suit, usually we play the ace king. And then if it splits two, two, or if the diamond queen is a singleton, then we're going to take all of our tricks. All right. But now we need to be a little bit careful. And this is where making a plan is. So if we take the ace king of diamonds and let's say it splits two, two, like we we're hoping. Now, when we play the third diamond, look what's going to happen. In the south, we have the jack, 10, nine of diamonds. We can't unblock those diamonds. The third diamond is going to end up being one in the south hand. Now, what's the problem with that? Is do we have any other entries to get back to north to run all our good little diamonds that we wanted to, to take? The 10 of clubs? No, it looks like queen, king, queen, jack of clubs are missing. We have little cards and the spades and the hearts. And so we're not going to have a way to get back there. Now, remember, we had two hearts. We had the ace of clubs and the ace of spades guaranteed. So we already had four tricks. Now we only need five diamonds. So is there a way to avoid sort of this blockage? And yes, there is. So if we play the jack of diamonds and the west follows low, we can just do a finesse. Now, even if east wins it, 
whatever other suit they play, we have the ace of spades, we have the ace of hearts and the ace of clubs, so we can win no matter what suit they play. And now your 10 nine of diamonds are going to fall beneath the ace king of diamonds, and we know that all our diamonds are going to be good. And so then we can enjoy the seven, six, and four of diamonds for the long diamonds. All right. So sometimes, even though we usually say eight ever, nine never, we need to be more careful instead of just relying on these little um, sayings. And we need to look deeper and see that, oh, we actually have an issue. If we play the ace king of diamonds, we're never going to get back there. So we don't really care where the, the queen is. We're happy to lose a trick to the queen of diamonds. Um, but we need to do that early so that we can get back over there with the ace king of diamonds and run all our, our good little diamonds. All right. So that's an example of making a plan during the play. Um, here's another play problem. So um, again, we're playing imps. So we want to guarantee our contract. And let's say the bidding was two no by south and then north bid three no trump. All right. Um, you could do stamen, but let's just say when two no, three no, and I keep it simple. All right. Now, Wes leads the jack of spades, and we want to start thinking again. So we want to try and count our winners at no trump. So it looks like we got the ace, king, queen of spades. So we're going to have three top spade tricks. We have the ace, king of diamonds. So that's two more tricks. That's five. We have the ace, king of clubs. So that's two more. That's seven. And we need nine total tricks. So it looks like we have some possibilities in clubs, right? If the clubs are four, triple three around the table, when we lose one club, then our last club's going to be good. And the hearts also look promising, right? We're missing the ace and the queen. But for example, we could think about winning the jack of spades in north and finessing against the, the queen of hearts in the east hand. And then if that wins, go back to the king of diamonds and finesse again. Um, so that's one possibility. Now, the problem with that is what if the Queen of Hearts isn't in the East? It's in the West. All right. Well, let's, again, try and make a plan. Let's think about what's going to happen. So if we win the King of Spades and we play a heart and it, to the Jack and it loses to the Queen. All right. Now, they're going to come back another Spade. We win our Spade. Now... Uh, or actually, let's say they come back a diamond. That's the, the, the most dangerous one. So we're going to win the diamond and our hand. And now we try and knock out the ace of hearts. Now, when they play another diamond, we still have that same blockage problem. We have only high hearts in our hand, and we have no way to get back to the north to cash our last good heart. So... Given all that sort of hints, everyone think for another 15 or 20 seconds, and let's think about, is there any way that we can guarantee our contract? Is there any way that we can make sure that we're going to get our good heart? All right. Now, the trick to realize here is it's a little bit counterintuitive, but we have two entries to north. And we have to knock out two hearts. So what we want to do is we want to save those entries until we knock out the hearts. So if we win the jack of spades in our hand with the ace of spades, we could just play the king of hearts out of our hand. We don't care who that loses to. Whatever they play back, we can win. Now we can play the jack of hearts out of our hand. Again, we don't care who that loses to. And then we're going to have the entries to cash our ten of hearts and then get back over to north and cash our nine of hearts. So that will give us three total spades, two total hearts, two total diamonds, ace, king of diamonds, and two total clubs. So that's nine tricks. So admittedly, this isn't super easy to see. Like it's natural to try and finesse in hearts, but if we can plan ahead and see that, oh, we only have two entries, then we gotta just play the hearts out of our hand and not worry about finessing the queen of hearts because if we lose that finesse, we're not going to be able to get that back there, and then we're not going to have enough tricks. All right. So um, again, it's it's not easy to do sort of that far ahead. You know, the first time you're trying to make a plan, but this is where you're going to get better and better at bridge. The more you stop, the jack of spades is led. 
and try and think through how the play is going to go. All right. Um, here's the next one. All right. So as south, we're going to open a spade. North bid a 4C no trump. As south, we had a six card spade suit and 13 points. So we rebid our two spades. And now north had their limit raise with ace, king, third of spades. And since they had, they know now that we have a nine card spade fit because we rebid two spades showing six, they decided to just kick it in and bid four spades. All right. So that seems pretty reasonable. Now, what happens? West leads the ace of diamonds. Now we want to take a second and make a plan. And so let's look at our prospects. Well, they led the ace of diamonds. They're probably going to play the king of diamonds next. They probably led from the ace king. We don't have any losers in spades. In hearts, we have the ace king of hearts, but then we have a loser in a heart. We have those two losers in diamonds. And then we have one loser in clubs, right? We're missing the ace of clubs. And when we're in four spades, so we need to try and only lose three cards instead of four cards. We have four potential losers. We have the heart, two diamonds, and a club. So the two diamonds and a club look like we can't avoid them. So the only way that we could avoid our losers is if we can get rid of our heart. All right, so let's see what happens. So they West led the ace of diamonds, and then they played the king of diamonds. So we've lost our two tricks, and now they play a heart. So we win the heart in our hand with the ace. Now, this is where it's really important to make a plan. Where's the only place that we can get rid of that heart? Well, we can't rough anything. The only way we can get rid of that heart is if we can somehow set up our clubs, then we could play the, you know, uh, the long club, the jack of clubs, and pitch our little deuce of hearts in the south hand. All right. So do we just draw trumps and then worry about clubs, or do we want to take our time and make a plan? Well, given the title of the talk, we want to, you know, take our time and make a plan. So what were to happen if we were to draw the trumps? So let's say the trumps are three ones. We play three rounds of spades. All right, now we're in north and we play a club towards our king. Well, if they take the ace, now we have the five to get back to play the queen jack. But what if we're playing against someone really good and they realize that and they duck the king of clubs? All right, then you play the five of clubs and they play the queen and they win the ace, all right? Now, since you've played all three of your spade trump uh, spade tricks and we've played the two club tricks, we have no way to get back there for the jack of clubs. So what we wanna do instead of drawing all the trumps right now is we can play one round of trump. So we can play the queen of spades out of our hand. And then before we finish drawing the trumps, what we want to do is knock out the ace of clubs, and then we can use our ace king of spades to get back and use that, uh, that jack of clubs to pitch our little heart. So the contract's actually cold if the clubs are 4-2 or 3-3, and the spades are 3-1 or 2-2. So if we play the queen of spades, we can project the plan, play the low spade. Now we play the king of clubs to try and unblock the hand from our from south it doesn't matter if they win this one or if they win the second one if they play a heart we're going to win with our king of hearts if they play a another club trying to give their partner a club rough we can rough high with our jack of spades then use our two little spades to cross over to the ace king and draw the rest of the trump and then now we have the queen jack ten of clubs to use one of those to pitch our little heart and we're going to make our contract. So that one was something that we could definitely project, but we had to take our time instead of, oh, we're in, let's draw Trump. Now what? Before we draw the Trump, we want to say, what's our plan for the whole hand? And what, what we realize is we need the Trumps as an entry 
to get over there. So then we can use our club to pitch our little heart loser, which is our concern. All right. I got one last play problem that is the hardest one. So I, I wouldn't expect many people to get this right at the table. All right. So let's say we end up in four spades. Doesn't matter how the bidding went. And with South, we have seven solid spades, two little hearts, king third of diamonds, and a singleton club. And as North, we have four, four little spades, ace, queen, jack, 10 fourth of hearts, three little diamonds, and ace in a club. All right. So they lead the king of clubs, and let's start counting our losers again. When we're playing suits, we want to count our losers. So we have 11 spades to the ace, king, queen, jack. So we're not going to have any spade losers. We have one potential heart loser, right? We have the ace, queen, jack, 10. But if we take a finesse and uh, the king of hearts is behind us, we're going to end up losing one heart. In diamonds, we have three potential losers, right? We have the king, but if the if uh, East is able to get in the lead and they have like queen, jack, 10 of diamonds, they could lead it through our king and we could end up losing three diamonds. So we have one potential heart loser, three potential diamond losers. And then we got the ace of clubs to uh, take rid of our little club. So we have four potential losers. Now, again, we're in four spades, so we can only afford three losers. So... What would happen at almost all the tables is the king of clubs is led. Now, again, this is where it's gonna be important to make a plan. We're gonna win the ace, and then we're gonna to start to think, all right? We have a singleton, so why wouldn't we win the ace? All right, so we win the ace, we draw our trump, and we take a hard finesse. Now, it turns out that that loses to the king, and then the diamond comes back, and we ended up losing three diamonds. Now, admittedly, we were a little unlucky, right? It was one of two finesses. If the king of hearts was on, then we would have made a lot. Or if the ace of diamonds was on side, then we would have made a lot. So we just, you know, 75% chance, 50-50 on both of those, we were unlucky. Now, that would be where most people would stop thinking about this hand, but there's actually a way that you can guarantee to make this hand, which seems kind of counterintuitive. So where's the danger hand? The danger hand is we don't want East to get on lead. When East is on lead, they can play the diamonds through and that's where we have our three potential losers. So this is very counterintuitive. And again, I wouldn't expect most people to find it at the table, but check out what we can do. When they lead the king of clubs, there's no way that East can overtake it because that's the highest possible club. So if we were to actually duck our ace of clubs, now, West is still on lead. They're not the danger hand. Now, what do we want them to shift to? Well, it doesn't matter. If they play a heart, we can rise with our ace of hearts, and we still have our ace of clubs to pitch our little heart. So basically, we're sacrificing our club loser to get rid of our heart loser. Or if they shift to a diamond, now we know our king of diamonds is going to score a trick because they can't lead through the south. They're leading up towards our king. All right? So let's say they, we duck the king of clubs and they play another club. Now we can pitch our heart loser like we were saying. Draw some trumps. So we can draw two trumps with the south hand. Now check out what we can do. is We can cross to the ace of hearts. And now we can play the queen of hearts and do a finesse the other way. It's called a roughing finesse, planning on discarding our diamond. If East covers with the king, then we rough it and we can cross back over in spades and use our jack 10 to pitch our diamonds. And if they play a low heart, we're just going to discard one of our diamonds. And again, we're forcing West to be on lead where they can't attack our king of diamonds. So we're going to use these last little hearts to pitch our diamonds by forcing West to be on lead the whole time. So this game was actually 100% if we had the ability to duck the king of clubs and use our ace of clubs to pitch a heart. Now, again, I admit that's very, very, very hard to see. Um, and you may need to st stare at it again, and it's worth staring at again. And, and most people wouldn't find that play at the table. But this is an extreme example of making a plan where even at trick one, that's where we make the most common mistakes, is 
you know, I have a singleton, therefore I'm going to win an ace. But if we actually take our time, we can see that it's not a 75% game. It's a hundred percent game. If we, if we play very, very, very carefully. All right. So again, very difficult, but we always want to take our time as declarer and try and project how we want to play the hand, count our losers at suits and count our winners at no Trump and make our plan. All right. Let's talk about making a plan at defense. All right. So why is it common advice to lead a Trump opposite a two suited hand? Well, you want to think about how the biddings or the play is going to go. So for example, the opponents bid a spade, a no Trump, and then two diamonds. So we know that declarer has spades and diamonds, All right? What do we think about um, our left-hand opponent who bid a no Trump? Do we think they have very many spades? Probably not. They prefer diamonds to spades. If they had a couple of spades, they would have raised spades. So we can almost kind of picture that they maybe have four diamonds and one spade. So how is declarer going to play the hand if you think that, you know, dummy's going to have diamonds with them in short spades? Well, they're going to either have the ace of spades or they're going to knock out the ace of spades. And then they're going to try and rough their losing spades in the dummy. So we can already kind of project that ahead. And we might want to lead trumps from the get-go to try and eliminate the ability for them to rough in dummy. So that's a, the common reason to lead Trump opposite a two-suited hand is because when dummy prefers one, they're likely going to want to try and rough the other one in that hand. All right. So that's another example of just kind of projecting ahead and thinking ahead. Um, this is a really fun one. So this is my last defensive hand. All right. So let's look at what happened. So the opponents, um, opened a no trump, uh, dummy bid statement, south who we can't see bid two spades, and then uh, dummy bid four spades, right? So it was a no trump, statement, two spades, four spades. And partner leads the two of hearts, and dummy comes down, and you can see it. So dummy has queen, ten, eight, five of spades, king, queen, six, four, three of hearts. So they have five hearts. Ace, queen, three of diamonds, and a singleton, queen of clubs. All right. So whenever we're on defense, this is where we have a 30-second rule, and we want to think about what we know about the hand. All right. So dummy has two points in spades, five in hearts, so seven. Two in clubs is nine. Uh, ace, queen of diamonds, so they have a total of 15 points. Declarer has 15 to 17 points. So between them, they have 30 to 32 points. And we have eight points. So if we add all that up, then we know that partner basically has nothing. The maximum points they could have would be two points. All right. And we just did that by subtracting everything from 40. So there's 15 points in dummy, 15 points at least in declarer. We have eight. So we know the partner can't have very many points at all. Now, what about that, that two of hearts lead? Do we think it could be low from three or how do we think the hearts are split? Well, again, let's look at the hand. So dummy has five hearts. We have four hearts. Declare opened no trump. So they're gonna have to have at least two hearts, right? They promised a balanced hand. Now, if partner had a double tin, they wouldn't lead the lowest heart. They'd lead the high from a double tin. So we can actually tell with certainty the partner has a singleton two of hearts. There's five hearts on dummy, four in our hand, and three in declarer's hand. All right. What about the spades? How are those split? Well, we have three. Dummy has four. Declarer said they have four. So we're hoping that partner has two spades. So it's four, four fit by them. We have three and they have two. So just by taking this time, we could pretty much tell sort of where every card is and what the distribution is, all right? So now, instinctively, what we might do is we might say, all right, well, we have the two of hearts led. I'm gonna win the ace and give my partner a rough, all right? And then when I get back in with the ace of spades, I can give my partner another rough. Now let's think about that. All right. We know that 
our partner only has two spades. So if we win and give them a rough, now when they play another spade, that's going to eliminate partner's last spade that they have completely. So we're not going to be able to give them two roughs. Well, maybe they have like the ace of clubs. Well, they don't have the ace of clubs because of what we did earlier. Declarer has 15 to 17. So partner has between zero and two. So there's no way the partner has the ace of clubs. If they have, you know, can they have the king of diamonds? There's no way. Again, partner has zero to two. So what we can see is that as soon as declarer is able to draw the trumps, they're going to have the ace of clubs, the ace, king, queen of diamonds, and all their good hearts because we don't have a high enough heart spot. And so that's going to be the end of our tricks. So is there any way that we can possibly set this contract? Well, there is, and it's very, again, tricky to see. But what if when we win our ace of hearts, instead of giving partner a rough, we play our singleton? All right, so we play our singleton. Yeah, it looks kind of scary into the ace queen, but we know that declarer has the ace king queen, so we're not actually giving them anything. All right, so we play a diamond. Now they play a spade. Now, when we win our ace on the very first trick, most important play is we got to win it right away. Now, partner started with two spades, and we haven't given them a rough yet. So when they play one spade, that goes one of the partner spades. But now we can give partner a heart rough. And now partner can give us a diamond rough. So by delaying the rough, we're able to get still the heart rough. And then we're going to, in addition, get our own diamond rough. So we're going to get two aces, a heart rough, and a diamond rough. And we're going to be, beat the contract and probably be in the newspapers because of how well we de uh, defended the hand. All right. So we can sort of see how that plan would work. Uh, the other way that you can do it is by doing it the, you know, the immediate rough, ace of hearts, heart rough. We can see that there's no way that we can give partner a second rough because they just don't have enough spades. All right. So... That's making a plan on defense. And that's why we want to take 30 seconds or 45 seconds every single time as soon as dummy hits. All right. Again, some of these examples are hard. Um, and I don't expect everyone to see it the first time, but we will strive to try and, you know, see some of these plays. All right. And the last thing I was going to say was um, planning the play during the bidding. So the really, really, really good players can sort of picture partner's hands, picture their hand, and they can see how they're going to play the hand um so common examples of that our partner opens a no trump we know that they're a balanced hand what are the sequence of questions that we want to ask you know maybe we have uh you know a running spade suit and we just want to play three no even though we might have a four card uh, four spade or a eight card spade fit maybe we have um a weak suit that we're worried about that we need to rough some losers and so we prefer to play in the major as opposed to three no trump so really good players are able to sort of project that plan and then if you want to look up something really crazy, John Kraniak's one of the best players in the world. And there's a famous hand in the world championships where he had this really strong hand down below that I'm showing you, this 18 point hand. And he opened a club and his uh, left-hand opponent bid Michaels showing hearts and spades. And then they played unusual over unusual. So he bid two, his partner bid two spades, which showed a good hand for diamonds, a higher suit for uh of the two suits and then his opponent bid three hearts so he knew that his opponents had a heart fit and his partner had good diamonds and a shortness in hearts because he had four hearts and he was able to picture making six diamonds on a trump squeeze which is a advanced play just right then so he bid six diamonds over three hearts and made the the hand in really a spectacular way so if you want to look that one up that's that's one that's fun to look up all right um so that's all that I had. I guess we have a couple minutes left. Um, if anyone had any questions or wanted to discuss anything. Yeah, if you have a question, jump in. Or jump in anyway, even if you don't have a question. Hey, uh, Mitch, I just wanted to thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> Um, today, a lot of great information. My partner was eyeballing me the whole time during it. Um, also, I just wanted to, most of us know who Mitch is from here. Um, Mitch, we know Mitch because he was attending um, UT and while playing bridge uh, and here. Million bucks. Yes, that's right. So, um, but he has since 
graduated from UT and moved to Arizona where he's a professor uh, in finance at Arizona University. Mitch is a very accomplished champion bridge player. Uh, he's earned recognition both nationally and internationally. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your hectic schedule to remember us and to share your knowledge and expertise. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very Thank much, you very Mitch. Much. Good, Good job. job. Good to see everyone. Hopefully see you guys soon.